So the Temple Mount in Jewish hands, that was a significant development in 1967, in the middle of the Six Day War, towards the end, when they actually recaptured the Temple Mount. And from, there, from then, this has been a tremendous discussion. What now? So let's, before we go there, let's go to a little bit of history. Over here we have a picture, an artist's rendition, to give us a, an idea what the second temple looked like. Before we go there, what's the history of the Temple Mount before the temple stood there? So the Rambam, Maimonides, tells us that the location is extremely precise and extremely significant. We have a Mesorah, we have a Jewish tradition that Adam brought his first sacrifice at this location of the Temple Mount. Noah brought a sacrifice after the flood at this location on the Temple Mount. The, the famous Akeda of Yitzchak, where Yitzchak was bound as a sacrifice for God, was at the Temple Mount. All three, all, all the, the two temples that we had and the third one that we're awaiting is at the same exact location. Another point to add about the significance of just the mere discussion and the interest, the commentators point to a biblical story where the, which preceded right before King David purchased the Temple Mount, which was then in the hand of Aravna. What brought King David to act? King David has been thinking about building the temple for God for a while. And at a certain point, it kind of took a back, it became like a back burner issue. He wasn't pursuing it actively, aggressively. And a, a, a large plague broke out, devastating plague broke out. And King David knew through the prophet that this plague was because he wasn't pursuing a place, a permanent structure, an edifice for God. King David, right then, went over to Aravna and said, I would like to negotiate getting this place to build a temple. Aravna told him, you can have it for free. And he said, no, I want to acquire it in the best possible way by actually paying you full market value so that it's truly mine. It's not gifted. It's not something you're going to say, well, I only gave it to you on these conditions. Paid full market value. So what the commentators point to this story is to teach us just about the significance of the discussion, the interest. We have to keep it in the forefronts of our mind, the interest of when will we merit to have a permanent house for God. Not just the shoals, which are considered the mini temples, but the Beit HaMikdash, the grand temple for God. One more point to mention is that while there were, there were differences between the first temple, the second temple, and the third temple, the basics, there's one part of the structure that basically is identical, and that is the Kodesh HaKadashim. All of them had a Heichel, a Kodesh, and a Kodesh HaKadashim with a place of the altar in front of it. So the design are different, like you can see the three pictures of the graphs, the, the structure, but the main uh, part of the Beis HaMikdash is identical, stood in this place, and what we're waiting for is similar to the second one that was. Let's talk who visited the Temple Mount. So we actually have a piece of history that tells us that long after the destruction of the Second Temple, there was a Beit Medrash that was located right near the place where the Beit HaMikdash stood, and Jews had permission from the Arabs then to go up there, pray, not exactly in the Beit HaMikdash, but near the Beit HaMikdash. They would pray there and they would learn there. They weren't allowed, they weren't permitted to build the temple, but they were allowed to have some sort of structure where they can gather a grand shul. The Rambam, Maimonides in his notes, writes that when he visited Eretz Yisrael, when he went up to Eretz Yisrael from Egypt, he says, I went to this special place. 
I went to this special place, which seems to indicate, well, not everybody agrees, seems to indicate that the Rambam ascended the Temple Mount and prayed to God at the closest he was able to get to where the Temple stood. More so, we know there are certain laws, which we're going to touch on them briefly, that the laws of the Temple apply even when the Temple is not standing. So, for example, we know the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Holy of Holies, was a place that was off limits to all Jews. Only the Kohen Gadol, once a year, was permitted to enter that place. So one might think, well, today there is no Beit HaMikdash, so I may enter there. So Maimonides writes that although the physical structure is destroyed, the sacred, the sanctity, of the structure remains exactly in its place. So wherever that location is, where the Kodesh HaKadoshim was, where the Kodesh HaKadoshim stood, that place remains holy. Furthermore, to point out, everybody knows what was in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. So we all refer to what we learned in Hebrew school, the Ark. That was the highlight of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, the Kruvim. But how many people are familiar that for the last 50 years of the first temple and throughout all 420 years that the second temple stood, there was no ark there. The ark was hidden, but the location was still sacred. The Kohen Gadol still entered this place even though it, it, was, it was a hollow room. It was empty. There was just a stone there. That place remained the sacred place. Continuing. What we're going to focus, while there is probably, a, if you wanted to make a compilation of how many opinions there are where the temple stood, you can probably compile as many as 13 different opinions and each person bringing proofs to back up his opinion and questions and arguments against the other ones. We're going to focus, for the sake of clarity, on the two most popular opinions one is much more popular than the other one, but the second one is yet still a considered a mainstream opinion of where did the temple stand. Let's add one more part of significance. Why does it make a difference to us to know exactly where it stood? And I'll say two, two points. The first point is today, if we wanted to go onto the Temple Mount. So we know that while certain contaminations that we have we cannot purify ourselves even by immersing in a ritual bath. There are other two modes that immersing oneself in a ritual bath, one can attain purity. And that can help to a degree to go visit the Temple Mount. It will not allow you to go into the Azara, but it will allow you to, to roam anywhere on the Temple Mount that isn't the location of the Beit HaMikdash. So the first point being, if I wanted to visit the Temple Mount and I went to a mikvah, a kosher ritual bath, I may think that if I know exactly where the Temple stood, as long as I stay away from that exact place, I'm good to go. That's point number one. Then there's a second argument, which over here some people subscribe to it and some people don't. And that is, let's talk for a moment about the Third Temple. Is the third temple something that we wait for it? Is it something that we just work towards by doing some mitzvot, learning some more Torah, doing acts of charity, and wait for this miraculous third temple to appear? Well, there is sources that that is precisely what we're able to do, and we're not allowed to build the third temple until God builds it. We say in the Az Yashir, Mikdash Adnai Konenu Yadecha, that there will be a temple that God builds. The first two temples were built by men. King Solomon built the first temple. The second temple was built by the Jews that went back up from exile with Ezra. But Mikdash Adnai Konenu Yadecha, the hands of God will build, is referring to the third temple. That's accepted by many authorities, amongst them the famous commentator Rashi. However, not everybody subscribes to that. There are the authorities that say there may be a miraculous temple that comes, but that doesn't exempt us from one of the 613 commandments. If you open up Maimonides, one of the 613 commandments is build a temple for God. So the moment you have the ability to do that, similar to the realities that were after 1967, where the Temple Mount was for, for a number of years, 
literally in the hands of the Jewish people. They didn't even pass over the control to Jordan. So that's when this discussion exploded. Go ahead, build that temple. Build that temple. Don't wait for another miracle. We got to build it. Hire the best architect, collect the funds, put it together and restore it. Who destroyed the temple? It was destroyed by man. Who will, who will rebuild it? Man will rebuild it. They even point to a medrash that tells us that in the time of the sage, Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah, one of the Talmudical sages, there was a short period, this was about a number of, a few hundred years after the destruction of the, of the second temple, where they had, they attained a permission and they started working towards the third temple. So they point to this medrash and say, this is proof that you don't wait for a miracle. There was a, there was a movement that was handed by Rabbi Yeshua ben Hanani to rebuild it. And if that reality wasn't possible for 1,500 years, 1967, or maybe even 2019, you have certain Knesset members in Eretz Yisrael that are continuing to lobby that the government of Israel should retake control of the Temple Mount and go ahead, move forward with plans for a third temple. So for this, for this part, if we were to, subs to subscribe to such a, a mode of thinking, okay, we're going to build it. Where are we going to build it? It's only going to be sacred, like we mentioned the Maimonides earlier, if you build it in the precise location. The altar only works to, to provide atonement if it's an altar in its precise location. You got to know where it stood if we're going to rebuild it. Now, just because I mentioned that, I will for the sake of, 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 of honesty say that the prevalent Jewish accepted opinion is that we should not go ahead and build a third temple. While there are those that bring source that we should, Maimonides, which was one of the only commentators that described the Messianic era, and almost no one argued on him, which suggested that everybody was in agreement with him, says that the third temple can only happen in Messianic times. It's something that the Messiah, it's one of his tasks to build the temple. It's not something that we should do. However, interest in the subject information to know where it stood, that's certainly an important discussion to have. Let's continue. Here you have a picture of today what the Temple Mount looks like. Now, what does this shape look to everybody? Anything but a square. Some people would say rectangle, some people would say no, it's a little bit different than an exact rectangle, but it's not, it's not a square. When you look in the Mishnah, the Mishnah that describes the Temple Mount, the Mishnah describes a square, a point on a mountain that was 500 by 500 amot. When we translate amot into feet, into what, what we, the way we think today, think about it as roughly 18 inches, a foot and a half for an ama, or 24 inches. So if you want to go in this largest measurement, you're talking about 1,000 feet by 1,000 feet. That is much larger than what we're seeing over here in the picture. When we look in the picture, and you look from this point of the wall, right here is the western wall. Every, all of us, when we visit Eretz Yisrael, this part of the Western Wall, the Western Wall is only a small part of the wall that is exposed that runs from the southern side all the way to the northern side. If you measure that wall at this point, it would be 1,700 feet. That is far larger than 500 by 500. How did that happen? When did the change take place? Like everything, not everybody agrees, right? two Jews, three opinions, but most people believe that the person responsible for this modification and expansion of the Temple Mount area was the famous builder and architect known as Herod, Hordus. The Talmud in Baba Basra tells us how Herod was looking for atonement for some unspeakable atrocities that he did in the beginning of his, of his kingship. And he approached one of the Jewish sages that remained, Baba ben Buta, and said, how do I gain atonement? And Baba ben Buta told him, well, the temple is right now 300 years old. It's dilapidated. It's falling apart. You're a master builder. Put your effort to it. Rebuild it. And that would be your atonement. You restore the light of the Jewish people by putting back the temple. Now, Hero, if any of you have visited some of his other structures that still stand today. Some of the gymnasiums that he put up, 
in, in Israel, you'll notice everything that he did was going to be grand. He doesn't get involved in something to just do a restoration project. If he's going to put his hands on it, and he always put his stamp, you know, certain people, when they build a building, they like to make sure everybody knows what type of tower it's called. Well, Herod was that type of person. When he built something, he didn't put letters on it, but he put his stamp of approval. This is Herodian built. Well, take a look. What, what does that look like for a moment? Okay, right over here. Does everybody make out that border around the stones? This is Herodian stone. That's Herodas' stamp. You have that on all the structures that he built. Okay, over here you can see some of the stones that are still there, knocked down, remaining on the southern wall, and you can make out again. If you look closely, you can make out the borders, and you can make out the pilasters that he would build this design that we see by the Marat HaMachpelah, you can make that out. This was the top part of the wall. Let's continue. Okay, these are just some pictures we're glancing over of what remains from the original expansion. But let's talk for a moment. How did he do it? How did Hordas do it? So the simple idea of what he did was he created a retaining wall. If you're going to build a, if you're gonna build a new platform, First thing you have to start with is build a strong retaining wall. Then, instead of filling it with earth, for multiple reasons, both halachic considerations and practical considerations, he built arches. Those were the arches we took a look earlier. These arches are still there today under the Temple Mount. Sorry, just give me a second. Right here. You see these arches? This was his method of expanding the Temple Mount instead of filling it with earth. Continuing over here, he built a new platform. And then once the platform was expanded and it was beautiful, that's when he felt ready. Now's the time to rebuild a gorgeous temple. And the Chazal, our sages tell us that one who did not see the temple after it was rebuilt by Herod has never seen true beauty. It was a masterpiece. It was a masterpiece. It was magnificent. And the historians tell us how many people would come up to Eretz Yisrael just to marvel, stand from a distance, just to marvel at this building after Hero rebuilt it. Now, how does that help our discussion? It's what complicates it. Where did he expand the Temple Mount? If I would know, if I can locate, if I can isolate, where was the original 500 by 500? that the Mishnah talks about, I would have an easier time this figuring out on this Temple Mount, within that 500 square, where did the Temple stand? But if I don't, if we can't agree exactly where did Herodus, Herod, expand the Temple Mount, it makes it all the more confusing. So on this new large structure, where did the Temple stand? Obviously, even after he expanded it, like we mentioned earlier in the opening of the class, the Beit HaMikdash would not be moved. Even if aesthetically it would look nicer to be centered, like a lot of artists paint it, it's center right of this new place. If that is not the precise location, that is not where it stood. It stood precisely at its location. Let's continue. Okay, here you have interesting enough. We mentioned earlier that before you went onto the temple, you would go into a mikvah. They uncovered. The archaeologists uncovered more than 40 ritual baths right in the immediate location, right outside the temple. Just gives you an idea of how much they were used by the people as they would enter it. Over here you have an interesting one. Point out, you see this, this ritual bath? You notice the stairs? You see that little partition? What was that partition for? It, there was high traffic over here. And in order that the people that are just gained Ritual purification should not be contaminated by those entering. They had this little barrier so that they don't touch each other. Okay. Here's what it stands today. We are on this, we're within this red square. Did the temple stand? So let's talk about the most famous opinion that is accepted by the government of Israel. 
for now. That famous opinion was written by a Posik that lived in the 15th century, known as Reb David ben Zimra, or some people know him, by the way, his name is put together in an acronym, the Radvaz. The Radvaz. The Radvaz lived in Eretz Israel, and he spent a lot of time researching where did the temple stand. It was a burning issue. And he went to speak to many people. Now, we mentioned at the beginning of the class that in the times of Maimonides, they still knew exactly where it stood. They even had a, a structure there. But somehow, within those 500 years, between Maimonides and the Radvaz, Reb David ben Zimra, this Mesores, this tradition of where did the temple stand was lost. And he wanted to restore it, but he wanted accurate, authentic information that can be relied upon. Most of the Jewish people, because they weren't visiting the Temple Mount, they knew the location where the Beit HaMikdash stood was in this area. For example, it was asked by certain Jewish people that were living in Eretz Yisrael at the time, how are you so confident to live in the old city of Jerusalem? Maybe that's where the Temple stood. Maybe one of those houses in the old city of Jerusalem is the Kodesh HaKadashim. How do you know so many things happened? So they said, no, no, no. No matter what happened, Jews always knew the approximate location. We know exactly where Temple Mount is. However, on the Temple Mount, where the Beit HaMikdash stood, that tradition was lost. The Radvaz was on a mission to restore it. So the Radvaz, while many Jewish people did not have answers for him, he went to the Arabs that were in this city for generations and generations, and he started speaking to them. At the time, there was already the famous structure known as the Dome of the Rock. Ask them about it. What's the significance of that structure? Let's take a look inside over here. This is what it looks inside. Just a big structure, a launch around a humongous rock, large, tremendous size. What's the significance? So what has been confirmed by many of the Arabs to him was that they have a tradition that this is precisely where the Jewish temple stood. And this stone was the Evan Hashesiah, the foundation stone that the Medrash tells us that God built the world from. And they decide out of the sacredness of this stone to build a structure and protect it as a holy site. Their Advaz did another few calculations and their Advaz grew convinced, not assume, he grew convinced, this area where you see the stone, Dome of the Rock, that's exactly the Holy of Holies. Like we mentioned in the opening of the class, the entire 420 years of the Second Temple, there was nothing in the Holy of Holies but a rock. According to Advaz, what you're looking at that's it. That's what, the, that's what the high priest saw when he entered the Holy of Holies. There was no ark, but there was the bedrock exposed. That was what he was looking at. Once I do this, if I can confirm any part of the Holy Temple, where did it stand? The rest is simple mathematics. We have a math teacher here. The rest is simple mathematics because we have precise information of where within the temple everything was situated. So let me put this on the screen. If I can agree that point A, which is the Holy of Holies, is the Kodesh HaKadashim, I know with accuracy that point E, where you've seen the, the altar, that's where it stood. Any time you can confirm one part of the temple, the rest of the temple goes with it. There's no disagreement of the measurement and the spacing between these things. The only small disagreement is how exactly do you translate an ama into feet? But even that we can overcome, right? Because the Mishnah talks in amot. Do you translate as 18 inches, 24 inches? But exactly how many amot, no one argues. Exact consensus by everybody how the Beis HaMikdash was structured. So, like we mentioned, the state of Israel accepts this position of their advaz. Many people subscribe to this. And now let's go back to the discussion. So provided that I went into a ritual bath, I'm allowed to walk on the Temple Mount, not just on the expansion that Hero built, which only looks like Temple Mount, but it doesn't have any sanctity to it. I'm allowed to walk on the original Temple Mount 
provided I stay out of the Azara, provided I stay even a little bit farther than the Azara, there was something that was known as the Soreg, the gates that surrounded the entire temple structure that had various openings from at, up until that point. So in other words, just imagine, use the laser for a moment, and the Soreg is somewhere over here. Provided I stay out of this area, and I went first into a ritual bath. If I am convinced that their Advaz is right in his research, then I know exactly where I'm allowed to walk. I can walk here. I can walk here. I can walk here. Everybody got that? But there was the original Harabite and there was expanded Harabite, but roughly we're looking at an area, an enclosure that included the Harabite. Okay, good question. They don't necessarily govern that 100%. So if you actually took the tours up there, which we'll discuss if a person should take those tours, then really it's, I'm not sure, it, it, it could be, it depends also on the political climate, what is going on. We'll see if we'll have time to discuss that towards the end of the class. Okay. Another opinion that comes very, very close to the Advaz, and we'll just mention it, as an offshoot of Reb David Ben Zimmer's opinion, they say their Advaz got it, 80% correct, even 90%. One modification. We know that the Azara was tiled besides for one area. The place of the altar, the altar had to be built directly on top of the stone. There was a stone, bedrock of the mountain, that was left exposed and the altar was directly built on top of it without anything dividing it. There are those that argue this stone is the, old, is the stone that the altar stood on. Why do they believe so? You notice that crack in the stone? They traced it, and that crack goes right into a stream. And we know that on the Mizbeach, what you can make out right over here, there were holes right in the foundation of the Mizbeach to allow the blood to be poured down, and it would head right into a stream. Over here, you can see a little bit. They would go under to sometimes clean it out if it was stuffed. So the first two opinions before we move on to the next one, the first two opinions would say it's either, let's put this right here, it's either Dome of the Rock is point A or just take that whole structure and move it up a little bit closer to give everybody a point of reference. The western wall is right here. Right here, where, the, where you see the red, the red pointer, this is the western wall. If I were to take their Advaz opinion, so then I'm standing not exactly across the temple, but I'm standing as close as I can get, because here is the Arab quarter. The only time you can be directly across the Dome of the Rock and be safe is if you went into the coastal, into the tunnels. If you went into the tunnels, you'll see since the State of Israel took the position that the Dome of the Rock is the place of the temple, they put up a sign that if here's your opportunity to pray directly across it, it's the only place you can stand and be safely across it. Or I will take E, so this is very close to Advaz, this is still the location, and this is still directly across it. However, just move up the whole structure closer to this wall and put point E right on top of the rock. Now, there is another opinion that says this is all wrong. This is not the place of the Holy Temple at all. Why not? Multiple considerations. Multiple considerations. First of all, there is a Zohar, famous work of Kabbalah, that tells us that every single part of the Holy Temple has been concealed, nothing has fallen into other hands, and it will only be re-revealed at the time in the Messianic age when God will rebuild the temple. So the commentators on the Zohar say, from here you have proof that the Dome of the Rock, which is exposed, it's not hidden, and it's not in our hands, it has been in the hands of everybody but the Jews, trade a couple hands, but it's been in everybody but the Jews' hands for the last 1900 and 50 years, that's not it. How would you reconcile a Dome of the Rock being in their hands and also being the temple, mount, uh, the, the place of the temple with the Zohar? So that's a Torah proof. 
What about a practical proof as well? Let's go over to this. We know that the Temple Mount had a natural stream of water. How did they clean? Let me, let me clarify this a little bit better. With all the sacrifices, with all the blood that was poured out, how did they keep the temple clean, pleasant, beautiful? The temple was always beautiful. It didn't have a smell. It didn't smell like you would walk into some slaughterhouse. What was the secret? So the Mishnah tells us that there was a stream that would pass right across from, from the mountain and come down. They had a plug on it to redirect it. And any time they had to clean the temple, like for example, on the eve of Pesach, when all the Passover sacrifices, that was high time in the temple, they would open those plugs, the water would fill the entire Azara, and then it would go right out. So it would literally swim through, pick up all the blood, pick up everything, wash it right out. So people went investigating. Let's take a look. Where's the, where are these streams? Where are they situated? How would they work? Let's add one more part to this discussion. We know for sure that the height of the Temple Mount today that we saw before in the picture, that's not the original height. That's what was done all the time back in the day after destruction. They didn't have tow trucks, they didn't have tractors. So when you went ahead and destroyed a city, go clear the rubble. That would take forever, that's an impossible task. So instead what they would bring is two by fours, pass them across the rubble, flatten it out, put a new layer. For those that, were, for those that visited some of the houses in the old city, they uncovered the archaeologists uncovered some houses that are literally built three stories. They represent three different times of Jews living in the old city. It was, they were living on one level, it was destroyed, then there was a new level, and a new level. Let's go back to this Temple Mount. This Temple Mount is the same. That's why you go down those deep tunnels, the coastal tunnels, to get to the original platform, to get to the original ground level. Where was the Temple? Let's take a look over here. Over here they used infrared technology to read the earth, to get some sort of reading. The temple was a massive structure. It was destroyed, but most of stone doesn't burn, right? They burnt it. You don't really burn stone. You can char it. It doesn't really, they didn't have dynamite. They didn't crush it. It didn't crumble. So most of it was knocked down and it was fell right there, and then it was built on top of it. Let's take a look where the Dome of the Rock stands. Right over here, there's nothing really, there's no cavities in the earth beneath it. This seems to be the natural area of the mountain. How would you say that the temple stood here, and then it was built on top of it? Unless you would say that they literally cleared out every single stone of the temple. And that you would still have an issue. Let's go back to the stream issue. The stream does not seem to match up to this height. It only works if you were to accept that the, te the original temple was much lower. Because the height where the stream comes in, this is too high to really figure out how it made it up there naturally without some sort of modern day pump. How'd it go up there? How'd it pass right through it? Let's go a little bit more. Let's add. Where do you see massive cavities in the earth? Right over here. These cavities are so large that it would support the idea that it is here that the temple stood. And then you couldn't move those massive stones, so instead it was built up. This area is clearly not the natural height of the mountain, clearly built up. So that leads some people to assume this position. Perhaps the temple stood right there. Between the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. Now, if it was only these two opinions, we would still have a fairly easy time visiting the Temple Mount because I can go over here. I can hang out here. So yes, the entrance is right over here, but we can somehow figure out a way to get up here from here. 
from the Arab quarter, especially if I'm a brave person. Problem is, this is beyond the discussion of this lesson, but there's many people that have questions on both of these opinions. And like I mentioned in the opening, I saw a compilation of 13 opinions that put it anywhere from this corner to really outside. Some people argue on the accepted idea that right here is the Temple Mount. They say this is not necessarily walls that were built by heroes. It was someone that was a copycat of Herod. He was using Herodian design, but it wasn't Herod who built it. The original wall wasn't, was destroyed. Where was the original wall? So they argue with, again, each person brings their proofs. Very scholarly articles were written about this. Some would argue that the temple stood somewhere over here. And according to those people, if you wanted to visit, Israel has a, um, a full excavated site on the southern wall. Fascinating. You know, some people, I remember uh, one group, we took them, when we, when we did a camp, a summer program in Israel. So we took one group, and everybody before they go to Israel knows about the coastal tunnels, the coastal tunnels. They went to the coastal tunnels, they loved it. But I saw how much interest the boys had, so we arranged another tour of the southern side, where you see all the mikvaot, the stones that are still there, toppled from the top of the wall, like we ran through some of those pictures. And some of the boys said, I don't get it. This is so much more fascinating than anything else. Why does no one talk about this part? Living, living evidence, such living stones right there in their position when they were knocked down. You can literally see the ground cave under some of the weight of those stones from the fall, from the impact. So going back to this discussion, according to some people, you would have to be careful when you're going to the southern wall. That's where the temple stood. It's entirely outside of these walls. It's in this area, but not exactly. Most people don't accept that. Most people agree that it was somewhere within this. But still, it can be almost anywhere. Now, could it be that we sat down, bunch of scholars, all Jewish people, went through all possibilities, and come up with a couple of areas on the Temple Mount that one can visit and be clear according to everyone. You're not walking in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. You're not even walking inside the temple. You're just walking on Temple Mount. You went to a ritual bath. You, got, you, you attained basic purification. Could it be that there is such a place if I have this burning desire to visit the Temple Mount? So the answer is possibly. But here's the issue. Let's take a look at the Rabbanut. The chief rabbinite of Israel has a sign for anybody that wants to enter these tours that says in Hebrew and English, announcement and warning. According to the Torah, it is forbidden for any person to enter the area of the Temple Mount due to its sacredness. They don't tell you which area, which other area. It's off limits. Stay away. Why did they take this position? So, the Rebbe was in frequent contact with them. They consulted many rabbis from inside Eretz Yisrael and from outside Eretz Yisrael. And they were debating whether they should take a position like this, that leaves it simple, visit the Kosal. Visit the Kosal Amaravi, visit the Western Wall. Pray there, that's, that's, that's important. But don't go into this area that is so sensitive. Not because of political considerations, because of halachic considerations. Who would want, to, we know, the grave sin and punishment for someone that walks into the temple on pure? How many people are actually going to go to the mikvah? Those that go to the mikvah, how many people are actually going to be careful to stay exactly in this area, not in another area? Well, one person is going to say, I'm a follower of their advaz. I read his article, and to me, it leaves me no doubt. I want to follow him. Another person will say, well, I'm a follower of a different scientist, archaeologist, rabbi that did some uh, research and came to a different conclusion. You're not going to get a consensus. Everybody's going to be walking everywhere. The moment they're up there, the warning, go over here, don't go over here, it's like opening a can of worms that there's no agreement how to close it, how to limit it, how to direct it. And therefore, the Rebbe wrote to a letter to the Rabbanut and to other people that he's against having a discussion in the Knesset 
of where one can go and where one can't go because he doesn't believe it will work. And since we're talking about such a grave sin of going on the Temple Mount, which is punishable by karet, if a person walks where he's not allowed to, the Rebbe felt, let's keep the Western Wall populated. Let's pray at the Western Wall. Let's beg God for the time that we will merit the rebuilding of the Temple, and we'll all go up there. But until then, you can go to a rooftop. You can look at it. You can go to the Kaisal Tunnels, stand right across it. But going on the Temple Mount is, is, is going on to, it's entering murky waters. Hard to, hard to have clarity where one could go and where one can't. Again, do I have a personal opinion? Oh, the Rebbe, the Rebbe never mentioned an opinion. It seems to, it, he seems to have been convinced that no opinion can be clearly, uh, fully trusted. It isn't clear, and therefore, if he would really ha ha have an opinion, then perhaps he would advance that opinion because the Rebbe was a tremendous advocate of visiting the Western Wall. There were certain uh, factions, we, it's beyond the scope of today's lesson, but there were certain factions of Jewish people that felt one shouldn't go to the Western Wall until, until the era of Messiah, especially that it was uh, conquered through a war, we shouldn't have waged that war, et cetera, et cetera. That was not the Rebbe's position. The Rebbe very much advocated everybody going up to the wall. The Rebbe spoke about the beauty of the Simchat Beis HaShoeva, the dancing on the Sukkot that would take place always the, the, in, in the time of the temple, that was one of the highlights. When all men and women would come to the temple and there was the festivities of seven days, the Rebbe had such pleasure and spoke about it. How beautiful it is that once again, Jews are able to do Simchat Beis HaShoeva so close to the temple, to start reliving that to start reliving those experiences. But actually going on to the Temple Mount is a position that he was very strong uh, opposed to. Another interesting uh, thing to close with. Okay, so the Rabbanut takes a position that one is not allowed to go. However, the government of Israel allows on most days one to enter the Temple Mount, provided they follow security protocol. So what does that look like? Just to give a recent example, there was a lot of people that wanted to go up. This was on Tisha B'Av. They felt Tisha B'Av, Day of Destruction. Day the, temp the two temples were destroyed on the same day. They wanted to go up, but it was another holiday for the Muslims, and they felt it was going to be too sensitive. So they blocked the people, and it made it to the headlines. Some people were very angry about it. Um, so it, the government of Israel on most days, to answer your question, allows those that want to go up, but this sign that we saw in the picture still stands there today about not entering it according to Allah. And everybody has uh, free choice, right? We don't, uh, we, tell, we, we give over the information, but don't necessarily dictate it to you under the current uh, state. Just an interesting thing to close with. The Talmud in Makot tells us a story how after the temple was destroyed, Rabbi Akiva, famous Tana, that lived through the destruction, was walking together with his colleagues and they saw that the place was so desolate, so empty, that it was taken up by foxes. When they saw that, that this place that was so populated, so beautiful, the fox don't go to places where busy, busy places where people are uh, celebrating stores. There was, there was real life over there. So when they saw that, they immediately began to cry. Rabbi Akiva had a different approach and he broke out into a laughter. They looked at him and they thought, this is bizarre. What, what do you find uplifting about this? So he said that we have a prophecy. The prophecy told us that the Beis Hamikdash was gonna be destroyed and taken up by animals. He says, when I see that the first part of the prophecy was, was followed through with precision, 
it gives me the confidence that we're going to see the second part, that the God that allowed the destruction of the temple to happen will allow it to be rebuilt speedily in our days. So interesting also what made it to the headlines, this Tisha B'Av, besides that confrontation of going to the Temple Mount, were the fox that were observed taking up, on the, taking up uh, playing around, whatever they were doing on the southern wall. So some people felt that was a comforting message in the time of Tisha B'Av that it's, it's terrible to see it on one hand, but also uplifting that this was part of the prophecy. We haven't been derailed. It's a long process, 1950 years, much longer than we ever thought. However, today we are as close as we ever were to the fulfillment of once again seeing the third temple rebuilt speedily in our days. Very good point. That today, in other words, just to, to, to expound on your point, that while most authorities hold that we should not lead a building effort, physical, we should not be hiring the architect, we should wait for that era that's going to be led by the Messiah, the temple inside of us, that we should be busy, that we can guard, we can build, we can expand it, we can make it more beautiful and more beautiful. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely, the sign does indicate that we don't have clarity. And because we are dealing with a prohibition that is punishable by karet, therefore it is safe and sound. There's, there's really nothing to be gained. There's no mitzvah to go up to the Temple Mount when you don't know. In other words, to go to the Temple Mount and to enter area without the necessary purity, which we cannot attain today because we don't know where the cemeteries were and where they weren't, so you're losing much more than you're gaining, or really you're not gaining anything. And that's why one shouldn't go up there. Very good point, very good point. So, so to answer your, the parts of your question, the first thing is, Machon HaMikdash, the Temple Institute, um, has really two missions. The main mission is to educate everyone, to bring it to the awareness. Like we mentioned in the beginning of the opening of the class, how important it is that we don't just forget about this. We all care to have our house for ourselves, right? God wants a house. It's one of the 613 commandments. God wants us to build him a house. The Beit HaMikdash, the synagogues are good, but they're called mini temples. He wants the grand temple, just like we like to live, not in a mini house, in the grand house. So the first part of Machon HaMikdash, pretty much everyone supports. The awareness, the education, the, the you know, how people connect to this something that has been lost for so many years, almost 2,000 years. However, Machon HaMikdash seems to say that you're never going to know everything 100%. We feel that our advice has enough to support himself. That's the opinion. Follow it. And if we're one day we're wrong, we'll correct it. Follow it. Follow their advice opinion. And that's where many scholars disagree with them. And the third point about whether it's politically correct to just give it away. So that I'll just mention, I, I think you're right. In, you, in other words, you asked your question and also suggested that we shouldn't go on there, but why, why are we giving it away? And the Rebbe spoke about that very painfully after they passed over the control to Jordan and Jordan raised the flag. Now this was the same Rebbe that spoke so strongly, no one should go up there. So you might think, okay, if we're not going up there, what do we care? So they're raising a flag. And the Rebbe was so pained, almost crying by that gathering and saying, we're not going up there, not because it's not ours. Of course it's ours. You don't just let another country claim ownership to it, allow a mosque and say, go ahead, take it, put your flag, what do we care? When Messiah comes, we'll take it back. Can't go up there, but it doesn't mean it's, it shouldn't be sacred to us and hold it as such. Some people wanted to suggest perhaps making a synagogue it's not practical right now, but uh, they wanted to suggest, at least as a compromise, perhaps a synagogue in the tunnels, in those arches that we saw that were sometimes referred to as Solomon stables because they couldn't make out what were the idea of these uh, vast amount of arches. They were sure it was some sort of stable. So they called it Solomon stable, and it still has that name today. Some people say perhaps we should make a synagogue over there because we know that the Talmud tells us, Michilot. Lo niskachu, the tunnels beneath the temple, even if it's precisely beneath it, it's right underneath it, does not have the kedusha. 
And the Mishnah tells us if a Kohen became uh, contaminated, if he became defiled, he would go right away into the tunnels. And there was a ritual bath right over there. So from a halachic standpoint, if there was a way to get to those tunnels without entering Temple Mount, there wouldn't really be an issue. Politically, it won't go over very well. And just to, before I take another question, I'll just mention quickly, they once there was a group in Israel that felt, how can we be silenced when there's so many lies coming out of the UN and so many countries that propose that there were scholars that looked into this and there's no connection of the Jewish people to the Temple Mount? They felt it's wrong. Why are we, why are we, why are we allowing it to be, oh, it's questionable. Maybe the Jews allegedly claim that they once were there. We know that the temple is there. We know that there's so many artifacts that are there. Let's go dig it from the tunnels. They tried it. And the next time, if, if God forbid, we don't merit Messiah, you go again to the Kaisal tunnels, you'll notice in the middle of the Kaisal tunnel tour, you'll notice a big patch of cement, raw cement. How did that happen? What's the story? So you can confirm this with your tour guide, but that was the area that they were making a tunnel, planning on finding the artifacts. But many rabbis felt it was a terrible move because the same way we're not allowed to go onto the temple, we are not allowed to touch the clay kodesh of the temple. What are you going to do? So some rabbis said, okay, we'll dig until we find it. We'll take pictures and we won't touch it. Other rabbis said, come on, who are you fooling? Who's going to listen to that? Most of, most of Israel is not religious. Is not religious. They're going to take it. They're going to move it to a museum. And we know in history, we won't even mention it, what happened when the Jews uh, came in contact with the ark and other uh, vessels of the Mikdash without the proper purification. What ended up happening is they were doing it quietly. The Arabs got wind of it and they met them in the tunnel and there was a bloody encounter. But it, once it exploded uh, and it, it became public knowledge, there was an agreement to restore the peace and they patched it with the cement. That's that cement that you see right over there. Okay, so to answer that, it's not just prevalent, it's clearly in scripture, in Yecheskel. But it's not the actual Beit HaMikdash that will be 3,000. It's the Har Habayit, the Temple Mount. Yechezkel saw a prophecy where he saw the Temple Mount, an expanded, rebuilt Temple Mount. Now, some people come to this verse in Yechezkel and they say, okay, beware if you're going to put a few million dollars to buy a property in the old city of Jerusalem. Well, there's going to be, what do they call eminent domain. It's going to be taken over and it's going to become annexed to the Temple Mount because Yechezkel talks about a 3,000 area, much, much larger than even the expanded Herodian Harabais. Other people say, no, there, it's going to be some sort of miraculous times that we cannot exactly articulate, but you don't have to worry. If you're buying a property in the old city, it's not just about to be annexed. How it's going to expand is beyond our understanding, whether it will be a physical shift in earth or something far more miraculous, it's all up for speculation. But in answering it, there is a verse that says it. So the verse, no one, no one disagrees. Sure. Yeah, in short, very good question. We mentioned that the ark was hidden already 50 years before the first temple was destroyed. And that was, the story goes as follows. A lot of us think, okay, today we live in hard times. Today we live in, you know, a lot of disagreement amongst Jews. But back in the day when the temple stood, it was all great. That's far from the truth. After Solomon built the temple, first temple, highlight of the Jewish people, first time they had a temple built, there was only 28 years of peace and acceptance until the end of Solomon's rule. Right after King Solomon passed away, there was a division, and one king feared that if he's going to allow the Jews, the, the king that was outside the temple area feared that if the Jews would be Ola Regal, if they would go up there, so then they would lose their loyalty to him. So he stopped the Jews from going up. Then it went back and forth, and some kings were more pious and some kings were less pious. But to get to your answer, the answer was, it was about 50 years before the temple was destroyed, and one of the kings decided he is doing tshuva. He's restoring, he's opening the temple up to everybody. And he found, he located the Sefer Torah of Moshe Rabbeinu. And he decided he's going to fix that as well. For so many years it wasn't used. He wanted to fix it. He wanted to restore it. They opened up, and they opened up to a verse 
in Deuteronomy where God talks about the exile. And he took that as a sign. The days are over. It was already in the ear that there was going to be an uprising and the Jews were going to be exiled. For him, opening the Torah on the day he wanted to appear to that exact verse that talks about the exile, he felt it's imminent. And if it's imminent, he wanted to protect the ark that it shouldn't fall in the wrong hands. So the, the sages agreed with him that from then on it was hidden, even though there was 50 years until it was destroyed. They didn't know when it was going to happen, so they hid it as a security. Yes? It's a, very, it's a very good question, and it's a very expansive subject. Um, what's the sanctity of a synagogue after no one is using it? We have certain Jewish communities that had a synagogue, and then... They couldn't put together a minion. They sold it off. Today, the synagogue belongs to someone else. Does the synagogue still have some sort of sanctity? Should I go on a mission and redeem it? So it's, it's beyond the scope of answering in a minute, but it really depends how the synagogue was built, what conditions were made when it was built, because a lot of the sanctity is dependent on this, on how much sanctity we give it as we go, as we, ha as we embark on the mission of building it. So it depends the situation, the scenario, where it was built, how it was built, what was the intention, what do we know about it, what do we do when we don't know it, and that's why many rabbis discuss it, each situation is unique. If you liked that video, hit the subscribe button and notification bell below for hours of the best Jewish content online.